And we are live. Okay, so um, welcome everyone to the uh, November 2018 um, ENSO seminar. Um, as is usual at um, this stage of the proceedings, we'll have a, a relatively slow start um, to allow people to up the speed. And we have um, a couple of other uh, members of the community who hopefully will be joining us live. Our speaker this month um, will be Harry Heft from Denison University. Harry, Harry. a psychologist, um, a professor emeritus psychologist in uh, Denison who has worked in the area of ecological psychology and environmental psychology for many years, um, has, uh, taught and teaches in the area of um, environmental psychology and cultural psychology. Harry's most um, probably best known work and, and the, the place where I first uh, came across his work was his impressive tome, Ecological Psychology in Context, tracing the um, the, the lineage of um, James Gibson's talk back to William James, and also connecting it with the uh, other domains of ecological psychology, um, such as Roger Barker's work, which uh, will form the basis of much of what is Harry, uh, Harry's going to talk about today. Um, so just before we get started with the actual talk, uh, we have a, a little bit of news, um, which we can share, if I can uh, bring up. The, in the, the, the coming weeks, um, Ezekiel Di Paolo, Hannah Dieger, and Elena Kufari will have a new book released um, called Linguistic Bodies. So it's a, a, a substantial um, contribution to the, the whole field of um, understanding language um, from an inactive perspective. Um, it's a, I've been able to see um, some of, of the, the work and I'm very much looking forward to uh, reading the, the full work itself. Um, looking at the whole issue of embodiment um, from the ground up, um, very much from um, in a, a depth that is well worth exploring. Um, and we are lucky enough as well to um, be able to, if you uh, buy now or buy soon, there's a code here that you'll be able to use to get 30% off from the MIT Press website as well. So you can swipe that code um, and uh, use it to save yourself a bit of cash on an otherwise very good um, expenditure of money. Um, okay, so that is... Um, now, so that's it in terms of sort of initial news. So um, that being the case, I think we have, we still possibly going to have one or two people will join us a little bit later for um, the Q&A session, we'll have a little, um, nice conversation. Um, but in the meantime, I guess, Harry, we should probably um, move toward the talk. Hopefully we've had a, a few people be able to um, catch up online. As well. Okay, so um, without further ado, Harry Heft. I, please invite you to, uh, to give this month's ENSO seminar. Well, hello everyone. Thanks for uh, joining. And I will switch to the slides. Uh, and, um, here we go. Okay. I'm assuming, I think, America, are you still there? Yep, still there. Okay. Are the that, all, that all looks good. You might not pick, there's a hide button beside the, the stop sharing button there, which... Um, there we go. Um, there we are. So we're all good then? Yep. Okay. Um, well, the, the, the top, the title, as you can see, is, is, is talking about emergent structures in everyday life, but they're emergent structures at a higher level of analysis than we normally uh, consider. So let me just sort of lay out a few basic uh, issues first. These are mostly issues that I assume everyone's familiar with, so I won't spend much time on them. I'm, I'm talking primarily from the perspective of ecological psychology, initially, uh, 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 James Gibson's approach, and uh, and but that will shift a little bit. The major assumption here is that our focus is on perception action. Percep is when we uh, look at uh, psychology from the point of view of perception action, we view the individual as an agent, an agent who 
uh, whose actions are intentional or goal-directed, and also um, that are embedded in a context or situated. Now, in, in much of the literature, and I think here is where ecological psychology might contribute to some in action thinking, is that um, the situated or the embedded notion of perception action doesn't get a great deal of play. And so, in fact, this is what I want to focus on today, is the ways in which action is, is, is embedded or situated in, in a larger set of circumstances. Um, <clears throat> so when we say that action is intentional, um, it's intentional with reference to what? And the most general statement we can make is that it's with reference to psychologically meaningful features of the habitat. The, the prototypical example of this um, are affordances, which again, I'm assuming the listeners, um, viewers are familiar with. Affordances are relational properties uh, taken of the environment taken with respect to an organism's actions. So here is a feature of the habitat. Uh, if you're a, a young child approaching this feature, it affords particular uh, actions like, for example, uh, climbing. So, so the affordance property is a relational property, as I hope we're all familiar with. If not, we can talk about it later. Uh, the other um, common referent that's treated in the literature is when we're engaging with others. And so in this case, others are affordances for action. And so the individual, in, in each of these cases, the child is a co-participant in a larger unit which we could call a with, borrowing from Irvin Goffman, that is, it's part of a dialogical unit. Again, the individual is intentional, action is embedded within this unit, and, um, and it's a dynamic process. Lots of people have written about this. I think the previous ENSO speaker uh, spoke about this as well. I want, to, I want to just highlight a couple of things here, that with the responsive partner, the, the individual and that partner co-constitutes an interaction frame. This is a, an, intera a, an intersubjective interaction frame. There's a common understanding of what's going on here. <clears throat> and we can understand this with regard to the diagram on the right, which is, comes from a paper by uh, Chimero and Turvey, where the constituents, um, a and, uh, lowercase b and c, jointly give rise to a set, a, uh, they they constitute it, give rise to it, and operate within those uh, the constraints of that larger set. And we'll see how this plays out uh, as we proceed. N notice again that this unit, this set, is an emergent dynamic structure uh, but that that's, that that um, that emerges from the interaction and the coordinated relationship of the constituent participants. Now, let me sort of shift gears and add a couple of other pieces before I go on to what I want to say. Um, E.B. Holt, who many of you uh, may know, was, was one of James Gibson's uh, mentors in, in graduate school, developed this concept of the recession of the stimulus, which had a big influence on, on Gibson. What he means here is that intentional action has an environmental correlate, it's, it's directed towards something. But what's important in this notion of the recession is that the reference for action can be specified with regard to features at different levels of complexity. So for example, action can be directed toward a single object, uh, toward multiple objects, which he wrote about uh, with regard to events of various durations, and so what we want to do is talk about action as directed toward structures that can exist at multiple levels of, um, of scale. And that is to say the scope of direction act, directed action may shift over time. There's a wonderful paper by um, Ludger van Giek and, and, and Rob Vidigan on uh, the horizontal view, which I, I recommend to you. So we're, we're looking at how intentional action needn't be just directed toward an object or toward another person, but toward multiple objects and even toward a larger uh, uh, unit and event. One other 
preliminary piece of information before I proceed is that scientific inquiry has tended to follow along two tracks. And um, Marek has a wonderful paper that he's, uh, that he's working on on this topic. And that is scientific, there's, there's, there's experimental inquiry, obviously, but also scientific inqu inquiry has taken the form of, na of natural, it's called natural history. And what we're all familiar with this in the sense of what's often called field work, like field work in plant ecology, animal ecology, geology, and so on. And the goal in, in much of, the na of natural history is to identify the frequency and circumstances of the occurrence of, of whatever your basic subject matter is. So in other words, if we're interested in particular types of plants, well, how often do they occur and where do they occur and under what circumstance? Uh, this work, it goes back to antiquity, but we probably can trace it most fully back to the work of, of von Helmholtz in the early 1800s, who in fact was a major influence on Darwin and, and prompted Darwin's voyage on the Beagle. And also in, in contemporary science, we're all familiar with the work of Jane Goodall. And again, the point of, of natural history is to identify what is, what is our, the basic subject matter? Where does it occur? How often? And so on. And then of course the question is, where's psychology in all this? And for the most part, psychology has not pursued this line of work at all. As many of you know, psychology is unique among the sciences and having started out as an experimental science. So there's been very little work of this nature in psychology. The exception is the other ecological psychologist who I'll mention today besides Gibson, and that is Roger Barker. Barker realized in the late 1940s that psychology was, was missing this vital piece. And so he began to, to conduct an observational study of the everyday actions of individual children as they went about their day in their, their town. Um, it was literally sort of descriptive work, but also Barker wanted to know, is there some discernible order or pattern in the child's actions over the course of the day? In other words, what might account for what the child was doing at any given time? And, he, and, and here's the overall conclusion of his uh, study, although I'll talk about it in more specifics momentarily. First of all, and this is, comes as no great surprise, the actions of any individual child typically changes dramatically when he or she moves from one location in the environment to another. How a child acts, let's say in a classroom or on a playground or in a pharmacy uh, changes. But the other thing which is really noteworthy uh, that, that he points out is that if we follow the activities of an individual child, their actions show greater variability across different locations. And that's what the prior statement essentially stating. Um, greater variability across different locations then do the actions of different children within the same location. Now, this is really unusual observation from the point of view of psychology, which assumes that the determinant of, determinant of action is sort of within the person. And what Barker found is where the child is, it turns out to be a very reliable predictor of what the child is doing. Now, the question is, why is that the case? And, and so that's what I wanna pursue for the remainder, uh, for the most part, for the remainder of my time. Why is it the case that children's actions change notably from when they move from one location and I'll use the word location here generally, uh, to another. And why is it the case that different children, uh, their behaviors are more similar within a given location than they are across different locations? For Just for our, for our present purposes, imagine this is the same group of children in each of these situations. Notice how radically their, their actions change across the situations, but how somewhat uh, similar they are, how more limited, or, or there's much more, they have much more in common within any situation. Now, why is that? Well, the reason why is, is that there's an emergent self-organizing pattern of joint action. This is not Barker's terminology. Barker called the referred to a behavior setting. What happens is the emergence of behavior settings. 
So what I'm doing, Barker was writing in the six, 50s and 60s, and, and he didn't have the same conceptual tools that we have today. He was working largely with the theoretical tools of cybernetics. So what we're doing is here is trying to cast Barker's thinking into dynamical systems um, language. And, and so due to the coordinative, coordinative coupling among the constituents, let's say in this classroom, what emerges is a higher order unit, in this case, the classroom within which those constituent behaviors are embedded and, and from which those coordinated constituent behaviors, uh, the setting largely uh, arises. Here's another case. Um, where a group of children sort of all essentially agreeing to coordinate their actions similarly give rise to a certain possibility, in this case, a game, which wouldn't be there if it weren't for the, weren't for the, the joint coordinative coupling of the constituents. There is a sense of there's a, con a collective intentionality. The children are, there's an intersubjective awareness that we're a part of something bigger. I'll come. I'll come back to that. And to, to try to talk about this with a little more specificity, the, the, um, the, the coordination among the, the constituents, the components, give rise to this emergent structure. And to sustain that emergent structure, the, the, the coordinative actions are constrained. So this is, um, this is a view here where the degrees of freedom of constituents are limited by virtue of their participation in the higher, higher order dynamic structures that they themselves generate. That's what I think is really quite interesting about this phenomenon of behavior setting and how it fits really nicely into dynamical systems thinking. Uh, Joanna Rezazek Leonardo has nicely stated this as the emergent stabilization of selective constraint on actions. Interestingly, her research deals with mother infant interactions. We're, using, we're seeing the same phenomen phenomenon happening at a different level of complexity. So, why is knowing where a child is a reliable predict predictor of what she is doing? Well, because we're considering her or his actions in relation to the emergence structure within which they are situated or embedded. So going back to where I was at the outset, we're looking at how perception action is embedded in a particular set of circumstances, which in part is generated by joint action. Now, what led Barker to the discovery, and I, I really think discovery is the right word here, of behavior settings? And, and again, this was, I would say this occurred in the early 60s. And I'll give you an example that he cites in his writings. I'm going to talk to you about 10 minutes of observations of a, of a girl named Maud, who's six years old in a neighborhood soda fountain. And uh, for historical purposes, I must say that is indeed the soda fountain <laughs> that he observed. Um, so I, I, I was pleased to take a field trip there. So let me help walk you through this complicated figure. What Barker has done on the left-hand side, the, these, these numbers, is, is, is the various things in this case that others in, say to the child, what he calls social inputs. And they're marked by these arrows, if you see. So he's, these are the various remarks that are offered by uh, Maud's mother or, in a few cases, the clerk. And this is, a, this is time. So these are the things that m mom or the clerk say to Maud, the, or not what they say, but when they say it. And if we assume sort of an SR relationship, you would think that behavior would follow from these, these inputs. But in fact, these are the inputs. These are, I mean, sorry, these are the behaviors. They occur over a duration. So this is the onset of one action. This is the on to offset of that one action and so on. So these are units of action. And if you look at where the arrows lay relative to the onset of the behaviors of the behavior episodes, you can see that they don't correspond to them very reliably at all. 
In other words, if we were to predict what Maud is doing with regard to these, these actions, which have a duration, some of which are nested within others, you can see that they aren't really initiated very often by what anyone is directing toward her. That is, there's no reliable uh, causal relationship in the sense of efficient causality. Looking, say it said another way, looking at the, the actions of others, they were terrible predictors of, the, of Maud's behavior. Barker was initially discouraged by this input and took th th this, um, these results until he realized something. If you step back for a minute, he realized that in fact, all of Maud's actions were in fact congruent with the setting in which she was in. That is to say, she was behaving appro perfectly appropriately with the, the neighborhood in the neighborhood soda fountain. Actions were appropriate to the type of place where they occurred. So why is that? And we see this also if, if Maud or, or children or, or, or in a literature class or an ice cream shop or a football field, their, their patterns of action overall differ. And even though we, we maybe couldn't predict them on a micro scale, actions are appropriate to the type of place where they occur. And so we might view this more in terms of formal causality, that actions take the form of the dynamic structure, the higher order dynamic structure to which they belong. And I've already explained how this works in some of the prior slides. So we, so essentially the, the, the soda fountain was a behavior setting. It has a dynamic, uh, quasi-stable, that is to say self-regulating function. It's, it's a set of joint actions by Maud, the mother, the soda clerk, and Maud's brother, who was also there, supported by the, the physical material structure available, the affordances. So here are the properties of a behavior setting. They occur naturally. They're in the world. They're not created by an experimenter. They're not necessarily, they're not in the head of any one person. They are properties of the world. They're composed of dynamic patterns of action of individuals with the support of affordances. They're in a certain place and, the, and, and behavior settings operate within a specific time period. So we can pinpoint where that soda fountain is when, as, and how, and how uh, when it opens, when it closes. And notice that it's not a physical location as it, it, that's part of it, but it's the, so the setting itself is generated by the actions of the people there. So after hours when no one's present in the soda fountain, it's not a behavior setting. It's simply an, an empty shell. A behavior setting is an eco-behavioral unit. They are, behavior settings are psychologically and publicly meaningful ecological structures. That is to say, they're perceivably meaningful and available for others to see as long as they've been um, um, come to understand what these are within the context of their community. And these structures stem from, as I'll say more fully, the normative practices of participants. These dynamic eco-psychological eco structures exist independently of any single individual. If, if Maud's brother leaves the, far, the, the soda fountain, the, the behavior setting still goes on. And they're self-regulating because if in fact a participant start, begins to act with outside the bounds of normative action, there, there are, the other participants can attempt to kind of bring them back into line. So what, what Barker did it, it remarkably over two full years and, and, and another year in another city in the UK, he, he examined all the behavior settings that existed over the course of an entire year. And this is just one page of a very long table, but let me give you an example. So if you look here, the, the um, behavior setting uh, type furniture store, there was one of them. It was open 305 days of, uh, during the year. It was in operation uh, 20, over 2,700 hours. So we can begin, to, and, and similarly, if we look at kindergarten classes, there was one kindergarten class during the year. It, it, it was 
it, it was active 97 days out of the year for 242 uh, hours in duration. If you wanted to, uh, if you were looking for a knitting class, there were two. Um, they, they occurred 45 times jointly and so on. If, however, if you were looking to this, 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 I didn't mention this, but the, this was the observation of a town in the United States in the Midwest. If you wanted to play a game of cricket, you'd find no behavior settings there. In other words, the, the, the behavior settings provide the eco-behavioral resources or the eco-psychological resources of the town during the year. This indicates what one could do in the town. And notice that these, again, these behavior settings emerge out of coordinative joint actions of the participants. So here is, um, if you will, a behavior setting, which many of you, be, you would be familiar with. Um, we could talk about the, the, the participants as having a sense of cl uh, collective intentionality. They, they know what the, what the action, what the activity is, and they all know that they're part of this. This is, uh, Charles Taylor nicely phrases this, social practices are not carried out in acts of single agents. A great deal of human action happens only in so far as the agent understands and constitute him or herself as an integral part of a we. So in this case, just as the case to the right, the, the constituents, the coordination of the, of the participants give rise to a higher order unit. What uh, I think all of us who read the literature in, in action and ecological psychology are familiar with the case on the right. The, the, the case on the left though is, is equally commonplace. And in fact, our communities are filled with these higher order units of collective action. So where, where might we go here? Well, the, I can envision uh, a developmental research agenda, which I'd like to bring up and encourage anyone to sort of uh, join in on. First of all, how do we, we want to understand how children learn to become participants in ongoing family and community practices. And part of this process is surely, uh, as pointed out by uh, Eric uh, Rietveld and Julian Kiverstein, it's a process of educating attention, educating the attention of the novice to selected parts of the world that has significance for a given practice. That is to say, we, 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 the individual is, is, the attention of the individual is brought to these significant events which have some kind of co coherence and structure. In doing so, the child learns about the range of actions that are permissible in that location, in that behavior setting. What um, I've written about in, 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 other, in various places is that this is not a matter of rule learning. Uh, rule learning really can't account for this for a whole a variety of reasons, um, but rather what's mostly happening is that the child learns, on, learns about what they would learns about what is impermissible in those places. That is to say, they, they acquire um, a sense of the constraints on action. And so then in, in any given behavior setting, there is a limited number, the limited degrees of freedom of action due to overlapping sets of constraints. So let me just give you one example here. So here's a child's party at a restaurant. And I'm, I'm, I'm speculating, this is open for research, that what accounts for the action of any given child is the overlapping of a several sets of constraints. One being, you know, what is it to have a meal in, in a public place? Two, what is it to, to interact and be in a, a restaurant? And three, what, what is it like to interact with one's friends? If you sort of bring those three sets of constraints together, we, we can see sort of the range of actions which are likely to occur uh, for any given child in this situation. We're not able to predict what exactly the child is doing at any given instant, but we can really delineate in, in, in a fairly um, uh, limited way uh, what the child is likely to be doing. And so, um, and also the, this is not a high, we're not talking about the determination of action, but rather 
within those constraints, there's a great deal of improvisation and spontaneity, which which makes them enjoyable and, and fun and a, and a shared sense of what's going on. The second uh, program of research which uh, one can conduct, and this is something I wanted to, uh, that I've done a little bit on, is that of course, for a child to, to act appropriately in a given setting, they need to be able to recognize what the setting is. The behavior setting is a, is a dynamic inter-individual unit. It's not a mere collection of people. In, in a gestalt sense, it should be some unit that is perceptible. The, the child, the individual should be able to identify what kind of setting this inter-individual inter unit is. It's, it's, it's an X, not a Y. So is, is there any um, evidence for this? And, and I should say also that in looking for evidence, we're also providing some support for the notion that behavior settings are independent of any individual. They are eco-psychological structures in the environment considered relationally. That is to say, they have a similar ontological status as an affordance. So let me explain this experiment that was conducted um, with, with some colleagues here. And um, what happened is we went into a, a number of low community settings and essentially choreographed over a 10 year, 10 minute, sorry, 10 minute period, what the individuals were doing. These are sort of paths of travel through a particular setting. And then uh, this was translated into a, an animation. Th these blue poles with a red dot on the end, that that's indicate their, the nose, are individuals, but we've, we've eliminated all features except for sort of the whole entity of the individual. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna move these individuals around in, in the same fashion as they were observed in the setting initially. And sort of like if you're familiar with the point light display research, where it's, it's similar to that in that we're going to see if, if participants in an experiment can identify through the movement of these, uh, what kind of setting it is. Can they detect structure from motion? So let me give you a brief snippet of, of one of these um, animations. And then after this, what I'll do is, sh is show you a number of choices with which the participants had to choose among or to rank order. Now the participants saw a bit more of this than what you've just seen, but then they were given uh, these choices and, uh, and asked to rank order them. W w how likely is it that any one of these was reflects the pattern of action that we just saw? Um, I can't go into the explanation of how we came up with these items, but it was based on a, on a, on a series of pretests. Um, and so, and what we found was that folks uh, tended to view these at th that scene as either a coffee shop or a restaurant, and rarely the other three. Here's another example. This one's going to have a little glitch at the end, but uh, you'll get the you'll see most of it. And then they were given the, these choices to rank order. Maybe you've made a choice. I'll show you one more. And they were asked to pick among these. We, we also did this experiment rather than having the labels of, of the places, just a list of activities, what was likely going on in the animations. And overall, what we found 
was that individuals were, were, were fairly accurate at sort of identifying what they were observing. That is to say, the behavior settings were perceptible. Now, it's true that some were, were more easily uh, identifiable than others, and it turns out that the ones like this one, which was a basketball game, where the actions have, were more highly constrained, or more, those are more readily identifiable. There were a few which we included in the experiment that folks had very difficult, a great deal of difficulty in, but looking at them, there were many possibilities. The constraints were few. Okay, so what, what I'd like to think about then is that these behavior settings are perceived patterns of joint action, much like the, the, the patterns that you observe in the flow of a stream. Behavior settings are like eddies that you can get drawn into. And so, to, to, to borrow a phrase from uh, Eric and Julian, we can talk about attractors in a landscape of affordances. In our case, uh, in, unlike their paper, we're talking about the attractors as being behavior settings. We, we, we carry out our daily lives and we have available to us affordance of behavior settings which we can dr be drawn into and can participate in. And our participation has to be normative in such a way that it sustains the integrity of the setting. So the, we're positing extra individual attractors in a landscape of affordances. They're dynamic and self-organizing. There's interdependence among constituents. These are emergent structures. They're self-regulating. And one other point, and this is the point I'll, I'll come to come near my conclusion on, is that they have a historical character. In order to understand them, we have to understand the history of the participants, particularly in the case of behavior settings, the sociocultural history of the individual, because these, knowing how to, uh, participate in a setting is based on normative social practice. We don't know much about this, and I think there's a really great opportunity to study these processes in children. So the title of my talk, again, was Places as Emergent Dynamic Structures in Everyday Life. We're, we're identifying higher order ecological structures as properties of human eco niches, in addition to affordances, and so to, to understand embedded action in everyday community life, we need to pay attention to the higher order structures within which actions occur and to which actions contribute and sustain. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'll just wait for you to finish screen sharing there. Excellent. Are we back? We are indeed back. Um, thanks very much for that, Harry. That all looks um, we're all set up there. So, um, yeah, so I, it's, um, I have a, 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 chasing up all of the kinds of things that I like to talk about and trying to represent um, points of view of a few others as well. Um, I guess, can I um, just start with one of the things um, you mentioned a couple of times, the relationship between um, uh, that the behavior settings um, had many properties that were similar to those of affordances in that they were psychologically meaningful, they were independent of individual agents and so on. Um, but there, um, is there, uh, are there any significant differences, I suppose, between behavior settings and affordances as they're normally considered? Um, aside from not being associated with an individual object, say? Um, yeah, um, I, I mean, one, one could call behavior settings affordances. I guess the distinction is that they seem, they emerge out of joint action among groups of people, uh, numbers of people. So um, in that sense, I just think, I, I would like to think of them as not op operating at the individual level, but operating with respect to some uh, social group. If For, for those of you who, who want to go back and read Barker's initial work, he in fact referred to some individual objects, like for example, a telephone booth, 
which which is an antique now, obviously, <laughs> as as being a behavior setting. Uh, I, I would take exception to that. I would certainly refer to that more as an affordance, whereas behavior settings are ent that entities that emerge out of joint action. It's, it's what in communities provide for individuals. It's, it's the basis, it's, it's a large part of the basis of social life. And I think we can then take an analysis of, um, of structures at this level and better understand structures at a much higher level like institutions and so on. And I've written about this in some of my recent publications. Okay, thank you. Um, so I, um, in essence, there's a, there's a sense in which a community, I mean, is a community then um, something more than the collection of behavior settings that make it up in the, in the same way that a behavior setting is more than the individual actions? Um, but but is, is that the same kind of relationship we're looking at there? Um, well, I think we, we, we would need to go to even higher order units, as I said, like institutional structures and so on. But, um, but I th they're, they're going to be, I, they're going to grow out of a, 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 a number of different settings. So if you take us, let's say a, a primary school, there are the behavior settings of the separate classes and perhaps of the administrative offices and then collectively we could think about the institution but um an individual is not necessarily aware of the operations of the institution they need to be they just need to understand their place within that immediate behavior setting so i, I think it provides sort of but you actually said this to me when we spoke the other day it provides sort of this mid a bridge between often what the, the, the units of analysis that sociologists are often concerned about and what psychologists are concerned about. And, and we can quite see how, in fact, the more sociological units might emerge from, or, well, I should say it differently, are grounded in psychological processes. I think that's the, really the right way to think about it, that we're ultimately grounding sort of these complex social uh, lives that are so, social structures we live in in psychological processes. They're, I'm not reducing them to them, but I'm rooting them in them. Okay. Um, so I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of fascinated then by actually, I mean, obviously there's, there's a, a massive wealth of history um, in uh, Barker's work and the development of it, but I'm um, I was sort of introduced to a critique recently um, of, a, not really a critique, I, I guess, but just a sort of an observation of the constraints of Barker's original work, given that it was, um, it depended so much on the observation of this single small town in rural Kansas, um, you know, Oskaluska or Midwest, um, being this kind of Norman Rockwell-esque, um, almost ideal of, of what rural America might be. Um, and then questioning, well, just how representative is that as a, a sort of community environment of the kinds of environments in which, uh, and communities in which the, the you know, a great majority of people, even in the United States actually, and um, develop and grow up in. Right, right, right. Um, well, I can make mention of a study that, uh, I, I'm not. I'm not even sure if it was published. Um, a study that was conducted by uh, uh, Barker's collaborator uh, Herb Wright and 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 one of his students, where they looked at small towns, middle-sized towns, and urban areas uh, in in terms of how well the notion of a behavior setting fits in. And just uh, to mention one finding, they they found that. Behavior setting applied more readily to big cities oh, okay. than to mid-sized cities, in in the sense that big cities form these neighborhood enclaves, which they themselves operate almost as small towns. So, uh, and any a, a common a remark that many people will make who live in big cities to those who who don't is, "Well, you think about this as a sprawling mass of people, but in fact, we're just a group of neighborhoods." And so it's quite conceivable that this notion of, of behavior settings constituting, let's say, a neighborhood, or again, I so called it an enclave, uh, could work quite well. But it, it's an empirical question. Hmm. Um, and, 
having said that, let me point out just one other thing to you. Um, again, Barker made this discovery like in the 60s. He received quite a bit of acclaim at that point. And then the, his work was promptly forgotten for the next 40 years because psychologists tend to not know what to make of this structure. And they keep wanting to read it in, in ways which just don't really fit its character. Now with dynamical systems theory and also with Gibson's ecological thinking, I think it, it can be brought back as something that is, is important and greatly understudied. Mm -hmm. But on the but in the end, I think the to respond to your criticism, I think it's an empirical question. Let's go look. Yeah, yeah. that's um, we in the armies of grad students and um, and and natural historians of psychology. Well, have to mobilize said army in the first place, I suppose. Um, I mean, the, the first the the a, a comment that's sort of frequently made when I bring this up in conversation, of course, is that. Um, behavior settings or modern behavior settings interpenetrate in a way that that um, would not have occurred in the the time of you know Barker's original work because of communications technologies that um, you know it, it used to be a time that you were if you were in a behavior setting it was more than likely just a single behavior setting whereas now we might be engaged in four or five different activities or usually at least two right so there's the mobile phone sitting in the corner of our site. Um, while we're also engaged in other kinds of conversation, or uh, certainly my students are never in, in, in a single behavior setting when I'm giving a class. They're always in at least two. And 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 so if that's the case, I mean, what are what are the costs of that? Mm. I mean, is somehow, you know, sort of the, the the resources that a behavior setting provides for its individuals um, are they less rich? Because people are sort of have a foot in multiple camps at the same time. Um, may, are we engaged in a behavior setting now? Um, I'm inclined to think no, uh, because the, the, there there isn't much that kind of con I mean, there's a bit that constrains our action kind of as a dialogue, uh, but uh, we can be doing all kinds of things, you know, while we're interacting with this. Uh, so with, I suspect there could be a, a sort of a real loss of community resources. A another way I like to illustrate behavior settings, by the way, and this is common, this is a common experience for American adolescents, and I suspect it's true in in in, in Europe and in Ireland and in the in England as well, is is the problem that adolescents have in in a, in a, in a town. There's often little opportunities for things for adolescents to do. Because the community doesn't re really provide behavior settings, or, or I say opportunities for kids to get together. Now, I think what's happened is, in the absence of sort of having nothing to do, that was that was the refrain of teenagers in the '80s and early '90s. We've got nothing to do because there are no behavior settings for adolescents. What's filled that void, obviously, is social media, mm. and. Um, we can then go on to talk about what are the gains and costs of that. The, the gains are that, that um, they provide inter adolescents with ways to interact with one another. But, but the costs are enormous. And that uh, I'll leave that to another time for any of us to think about. Um, yes, it's sort of um, very easy to let things uh, expanded to lamentations about the state of our youth, I suppose, in, the, in these kinds of circumstances. Um, can I ask then about you, you, essentially, you set forward a couple of lines of empirical inquiry um, that essentially would be um, recommended by a behavior settings, by a sort of a proper recognition of behavior settings and a, a use of them to understand um, psychological processes. So the um, can I ask you to maybe expand a little bit more on the first of those when you talked about um, developmental psychology in essence psychological development is the learning of the range of actions that are permissible in the various settings available to a child. Um, is there a, um, so you, you've already cited some developmental research and, and Nicole Ross Manitz um, work from um, the ANSA seminar just a month ago and, and Joanna Radzicek Leonardo's work um, who is going to be giving an ENSA seminar in uh, the spring, hopefully, um, just to, to plug seminars either side of yours here. 
um, are examples of, of work that fit into that framework. Are there any others that you might highlight, or do you think um, there's any particular gaps in um, on you know current developmental psychological research that um, really need um, addressing if you know behavior settings are taken seriously? Um, I th there's such a paucity of, re of research of this nature, of, 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 again, of knowing how children spend their time. There is, there, ha there's been a bunch of, there have been a number of studies looking at time use in in, in adolescence um, over the past couple of decades. Um, they often involve um, you know, kind of collecting diary information, or, but um, firsthand observation of of, uh, of action of adults and children is, uh, is, is really a vital. I mean, let me give you just m one of my favorite examples. It's not related to behavior settings, but it, it sort of, I think, makes the point really well. Uh, Karen Adolph, who does research on the development of, of motor development in young infants, has, has been sort of pushing against th th this, this position, which I think now is mostly uh, dead. But for a long time, the assumption is that children's emergence of crawling and walking was, a, was, sure, was purely a maturational process because it seemed to just sort of come on out of the blue. And, and what Karen and her students did was go into the homes of infants and just sort of watch, with, watch their, their, their locomotive behavior. And, and what they found, much like what the linguistic researchers find, is that children are, are walking you know, tremendous crawling, walking, uh, trem and the, uh, tremendously over the course of their day. I mean, they're practicing and practicing for hours and hours and hours. So what might appear to be sort of the sudden emergence of walking is based on just inordinate amount of practice. You wouldn't know that if you didn't look at children walking. And the same thing, I think, has come to our understanding with regard to the emergence of the linguistic structures. They, they don't suddenly appear. Children hear hours and hours and hours of language. Now you wouldn't know that those things unless you actually did the descriptive work. Mm -hmm. Let me, um, if I may, bring up a somewhat different point. Mm -hmm. and again, it's and, and and I was thinking about this with regard to my comment on social media, and it has to do with um, the university where I where I work. Uh, there, like many places, there's been movement more and more towards students in communicating through social media, and and it seemed to me that what one of the effects of that was to kind of drive students into these separate silos of social interaction, and and not promote interaction with people one doesn't already know. Um, well, what can we do about that? Well, part of the problem is, is an architectural for a long problem. Looking around the college, it seemed that there were no, there were few, if any, good public spaces that would attract individuals, which might then create behavior setting patterns that would draw people into them. And so we just finished a two year redesign of, of the main plaza on the campus, which hopefully will generate much more public uh, interaction and therefore the creation of these social structures. Um, it was just completed, so by next spring, we'll, we'll be able to start observing all of that. But in other words, um, remember, behavior settings are not just about action, but they're, out, they're about affordances and milieu. And yeah. so we yeah. facilitate and structure behavior settings by, you know, what is, what's the available affordance structure that, that's also available? Mm. Okay, so that, um, I mean, I guess, that kind of interdependence between the, the sort of the physical environment and the the social environment, because the the joint action isn't um, or the relationship there isn't contingent, um, as I, I think you sort of said before in some of your kind of pointed out in some of your writing that um, behavior the the physical settings of a behavior setting or the physical aspects of a behavior setting are usually designed for purpose. They're and they don't just happen to. So it ha surely it happens in some cases where you have this um, emergent in, in an otherwise um, unstructured or, or wilderness space. But um, in the majority of behavior settings in which we actually exist or, or um, act, then they are 
um, you know, specifically designed for the purpose of enabling the joint action in question. That's right. The, the, the design of places can promote, not cause, but promote certain patterns of action out of which um, uh, joint action structures uh, can occur. Um, Eric, Eric Riefeld has certainly written a bit about this uh, too. Mm. Um, can I ask then, can I sort of switch tack a little bit just um, and maybe go, go a little bit more expansive um, just before we finish? Uh, and I might be throwing you a curveball here, which is not uh, my deliberate intent, but um, just to look at, at some of the theoretical context here and the relationship between behavior settings as a largely overlooked um, phenomenon and, and theoretical consideration and other areas of cognitive science or, or psychology that have had. Um, even to a large extent, possibly niche work, um, but nevertheless, that where there's there is explicit work done. So, um, just when you were talking initially about um, behavior settings and the the manner in which perception action has been, you know, everyone um, within ecological psychology, for example, recognizes it as always being embedded in um, a larger context, but that that embedding isn't dealt with explicitly. Um, to the same extent as other aspects of the relationship. Um, but I'm wondering about Russian activity theory then from Luria and, and Vygotsky and others. Is there um, a sort of a strong cons sort of consonance or resonance between um, mm -hmm. behavior settings, Barkarian eco-behavioral eco stuff and, and activity theory, would you think? That's a, that's a, that's a really great question. Um, and I, I've not thought about it before, but it seems to me, uh, to use Vygotskyan language, if, if, if the tools that we engage with essentially become internalized to structure thinking, well, could we think about behavior settings as essentially um, playing that same role? So we, can, we sort of, we know how to act in certain places because we've engaged with these structures. In a Vygotskyan way, um, I think that's a great idea. Uh, I haven't seen anyone write about it. Um, I'd encourage you to write about it. Uh, I'd like to think, and I'd like to think, I'd like to think more about it myself. Yeah. Um, let me let me maybe say one final brief thing, although I hope it's apparent. I mean, the the goal here, both with Gibson and Barker, as I've been talking about it, is how do we develop a psychologically meaningful description of the of the habitat? Mm. The, 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 the tools that we've used from the from other sciences like physics just aren't adequate to account for psychological experience. So the, the, the larger long range goal is how can we think about the environment uh, in psychologically meaningful ways? I think affordances is a huge step in that direction. I think behavior settings, in spite of the fact that they've been neglected, you know, also offer that um, benefit. Mm. Thanks. Yeah, it it it, um, it does feel like that the the ecological thinking and you know ecosystems thinking is, which obviously was sort of fundamental to to Barker's work, um, is um, I guess the sort of definite. Um, room for that to flourish a bit more within psychology and even within ecological psychology it, it hasn't it doesn't seem to have come to the fore in the way you might have expected from the way Gibson wrote. No, no. <clears throat> in fact, um, you kindly mentioned my book uh, at the outset and um, and, the, and and the, the first part of the book is largely on Gibson and on in its historic and Gibson's historical roots. The second part is, is, is on Barker and, I, and trying to link Barker to Gibson. Um, when I get comments from individuals about my book, it's usually only about the first half. <laughs> I mean, it, 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 and especially my, my friends in the ecological psychology, uh, as far as I can tell, tend not to pay much attention to the second part. On the other hand, my, my colleagues who are interested in, in the social cultural dimensions of ecological psychology, do take note of that. So um, 
Part of it might is, is I surely due to the fact that the way ecological psychology has evolved over the past 40 years has been um, in ways that hasn't fully, in, in, hasn't fully embraced social cultural factors. And there's a good, and, 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 and um, there's good reasons that folks might do that. But, but I, I'm certainly trying to do, uh, engage in that latter activity. Okay, excellent. Well, I think, um, Harry, I think that's probably a, a very good place to live, a nice finishing note. Um, so I'll just say thank you very much for your time and for um, presenting today. And, um, you yeah, know, I guess I uh, look forward to seeing more. Yeah. Well, thank you for inviting me. It was a pleasure. Thanks. Okay, so.